everybody, thanks for joining us on the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Well, the gloves came off this week in the race for mayor. I don't respond to kids. Candidates turn their fire toward each other in heated WGN forum. Meanwhile, Paul Vallis rakes in the most cash and scores an endorsement from the editorial board of the Chicago Tribune. Does anybody in here feel comfortable with what's in here? We just got this today. City Council puts the brakes on the mayor's major agreement for ComEd to power Chicago for the next 15 years. We believe that justice has been served. Cook County drops charges against R. Kelly to focus resources elsewhere. And in sports, Chicago ponders the legacy of Blackhawks legend Bobby Hull. Joining us are Marianne Ahern of NBC5 Chicago, Laura Washington of the Chicago Tribune and ABC7 News, Nancy Armour of USA Today, and Jason Meisner of the Chicago Tribune. Let's get right to it. Marianne Ahern, pretty good week for Paul Vallis. He lands the endorsement of the Chicago Tribune editorial board. He's raising lots of money. He's got the endorsement of Tom Tunney. Is he gaining some momentum right now? It does seem that way, doesn't it? But I would also... Uh, caution. You know who had the endorsement four years ago? It was Bill Daly, who did not even make it to the runoff. It is obviously a feather in his cap to have the Tribune endorsement. No one would say no. But we still, in this three-ish weeks left, I think it's a wide open field. I think it's still very fluid. And somewhere Gary Johnson is calling up <laughs> saying, hey, they endorsed me too for president <laughs> years ago. All right, uh, Laura Washington, is it telling though that Chewy Garcia is now running an attack ad against Vallis, playing these edited clips where Vallis says he's quote, basically Republican and pro-life? Give us some context well, here. Well, it, it, some of the polls show Vallis either gaining or actually maybe even being a front runner. So that's what happens when you're a front runner, you get beat up on. Uh, Chewy Garcia is going after Vallis, and not just Chewy Garcia, also the mayor, because of his supposed uh, position that he's anti, that he's anti uh, abortion and that he may be a Republican. That's Chewy's got a, a, an ad that he's actually playing to run that, this, that says that. And of course, they, they, both the mayor and Chewy are aiming after the lakefront progressive voters because they feel that that will hurt Vallis there, and that's where. Vallis may be gaining ground. And yet Vallis will counter and say when he ran for office before statewide, when he ran against uh, Blagojevich for governor, he was endorsed by Planned Parenthood and he says he is pro-choice. He is not. So looking at the raw tape though from this interview that Chewy Garcia ran, is he saying he's a Republican? And it, is it, it still leaves questions. He, he, and I didn't watch all of it, but the, they did send me more of the interview and I thought, well, you still didn't clarify what he was asked. And it was hypotheticals, and it sounded more as if on issues that he, and this was done in 2009, mm -hmm. and he was down in New Orleans at that Long point, did he feel as if some of the issues of the Democratic Party had left him? Well, clearly he's openly pro-school choice, pro-vouchers. Nancy Armour, do you think this kind of thing is going to resonate with voters in this election? I, I, I think it's... Everyone that I have talked to is, you know, kind of throwing up their hands in the air and saying, I, I don't know. And it's almost like, at least the people I've been talking to, it's a, what's the least worst option? Mm. And I think, you know, it could be something on the order of the day. If you have kids in school, especially if you have kids in CPS, are you going to want him? If you are, you know, a woman, are you going to be swayed by him? You know, the, the question about that, even though as Chicago mayor, you really would not have any kind of an impact on the state laws. Um, I, I just think it's it's such a crapshoot at this point that anything could help you, anything could hurt you. And yeah, there, we're not going to know what it is. There's a Harris poll that has close to half voters are still undecided. Yeah. And this is probably going to be not a, not a real high turnout race. People are just not energized and excited about it, and they haven't made up their minds. So it's gonna, really going to come up down the wire. I think any, any one of the top tier people could could be in the runoff. And Jason Meisner, with respect to Lightfoot, she's got these former supporters like Alderwoman Pat Dowell, who today came out for Brandon Johnson, and we mentioned Tom Tunney, the retiring alderman, coming out for Paul Vallis. He used to be a supporter of Lightfoot. Should voters care about that, that, that these people are defecting from Lightfoot? It does seem like <clears throat> it is a pattern where she, you know, a lot of people are, are uh, you know, distancing, distancing some, themselves from her. And um, it, it doesn't look good going in with only uh, three weeks left to have all these people, you know, saying I'm not going to support you when I did in the beginning. Uh, it just seems like that she doesn't have the momentum, certainly, that she had the first time uh, when the Ed Burke corruption case was in the news and um, she uh, came on like wildfire. Certainly, that was a huge turning point in that election four years ago. So, Marianne, where do all these other candidates stand? We've got Jamal Green, we've got Chewy Garcia, Willie Wilson, Sophia King. 
Roderick Sawyer. I know, with nine, that huge field. I think we're looking at perhaps four or five. I would put Chewy Garcia in the top five. The others who might be very good candidates, but without money to get out their message, it's difficult for them to gain some traction. Uh, Chewy has fallen, it appears. Now we have to look at polls to find out for sure, but when you're running an attack ad against Paul Vallis, that's one sure signal that you're not doing as well as perhaps you thought. It seemed to be that his strategy was saving some of his money, perhaps for a runoff. Now the question is, will he make it to the runoff? And Lightfoot's strategy is to spend all her money attacking right. Chewy Garcia. Is this a sign that the attacks that he's tied with Mike Madigan, he's tied with Sam Bankman-Fried, that these might be working? You would might believe that. She's doing internal polling, and she continues that, that whole line of attack. The other interesting attack that she's, she's levied at Vallis is, is the fact that he wouldn't come out and say whether or not he was pro-choice for, for and she brought that up in a couple of debates and I'm not quite sure why she continues that attack if I were her I would have been using that same video that uh, the Chuy Garcia that, that uh, was was used before by Chuy Garcia the video that shows Vala saying he's against abortion and for some reason she held back on on using that video and again maybe she doesn't have the money right now I think she's sort of third, third or fourth down in the fundraising race so she doesn't have the money right now well number one hands. since the beginning of the year is Paul Vallis who seems to be getting all these checks from he's had like big two business and a half million interest. dollars since January he's brought in so is he the consensus business candidate perhaps I would say at this point not only <laughs> did he get Tony's endorsement he'd got um, Brian Hopkins today uh, both uh, second ward alderman yes represents much of downtown Michigan Avenue Yes, I would say that uh, right now that Paul Vallis is the business candidate. All right, Jason Meisner, also this week the mayor unveils this charter agreement with ComEd. First off, ComEd, embroiled in all these scandals, admitting to bribery, right. paying $200 million. Should the mayor have extracted more out of this company given its vulnerable position? Uh, it seems so since uh, she, you know, earlier on she was saying we were going to get all these things out of them. Um, she seemed to have leverage. And now here we go with, we, with a month to go before ComEd. Uh, the bribery trial, bribery conspiracy of, of the former CEO of ComEd uh, and three others are going on trial on this bribery scheme. It seems like really bad timing. Also, I know she wants to get it done before the election, uh, but to try to negotiate, uh, obviously that played a role in it being tabled for now uh, in city council and uh, it's not, doesn't look good for her uh, right before the election. But um, this is all going to be going on. Of course, we're going to have a runoff probably in the election. And this trial is going to be going on in the middle of that runoff election. So uh, we'll see what names come up that we haven't heard already. Uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting things coming out. And this Nancy trial. Armour, all Chicagoans pay their utility bills to ComEd. Mm -hmm. Does it bother you that you have to pay uh, this company for your power, given all the scandals that they've been embroiled in? Uh, it, yes, I mean, of <laughs> course it does. And the first thing I saw when I, I saw the agreement, and, and maybe this is typical, I don't know, but 15 years, that's a long, long time, especially when you're talking about all of the transitioning to renewable energy that is supposedly going to be happening over the next few years. Chicago has a really bad history of these long-term agreements. Mm. Granted, it's not 100 years or whatever the tollway is, but mm. um, or the skyway. But it, it just it it really the whole thing seemed very tone deaf. And I thought it was interesting that that she was not able to push it through. I took that as is this a sign of weakness that she's that you know these uh, the city council is not willing to go along with her you know is it because they think that she's not going to be around they think she's on the rolls but but also they're they, they, they're bringing up the parking meter deal that was a disastrous yep. deal it was yep. also rushed through yep. and I think a lot of these aldermen the ones that are going to still be in office if, if they survive the election don't want to be accused of rushing through another yep. really bad deal and a 15 year deal that we're going to be stuck for and, yep. and stuck the, also the most interesting I mean do you not know lesson number one count your votes mm. right mm. <laughs> count yes. your votes ahead of not time Kevin McCarthy well, <laughs> well true Taking yeah. a play page of the Kevin McCarthy playbook but we should remind viewers this charter agreement is the agreement for ComEd to be the sole power provider for everybody Laura Washington why does she want to push this through so quickly because she needs a feather in her cap for for, for her campaign especially if she gets into the runoff she wants to be able to claim that she's you know brought this really wonderful deal to the city and 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 I think that's one reason why some of the aldermen are, are, are rejecting it. they're saying this is just an election this is just an election gimmick to, to, to benefit her, and it's not necessarily going to benefit us. By the way, there was a public speaker at the city council meeting that was thrown out, allegedly, and we're going to cover this tonight at 10, for complaining about this ComEd franchise agreement, alleging maybe the mayor is retaliating against her 
Does anyone know what's going on here? Well, there was someone at City Council, a, a public a public comment, and, and did speak out and then was asked to leave. And that's unusual. I mean, the, if you've listened through the public comments, I mean... It didn't seem like this person was violating any of the rules, swearing or right, saying right, anything lewd. Right, right. And, and you were you did an interview with someone this week that was kicked out of the debate a teacher, on Tuesday. A teacher who had been, she is uh, un unhAPPY with the CTU support for Brandon Johnson, is now making it a mission to go to many of the events and forums that he's at and protesting, saying, I'm going to do what the, the, what the union does. Mm -hmm. And now she has been removed from her classroom. Um, Laura Washington, I want to talk about this issue from yesterday, Woodlawn residents, now some of them protesting the arrival of migrants uh, to the school in Woodlawn as a shelter there. Remind us why this is so controversial. Well, I think it's another example of the, the Blackfoot administration not preparing the way, not uh, consulting until the very last minute the community. So the, even the alderman was blindsided by this, by this idea. Uh, some, some folks are just totally against it. Some people are saying, well, you know, we want to support the migrants, but we also need resources for our community as well. We have homeless people. We have other issues. And, and, and even in, in the Latino community, there's a Latino organization that's saying, you know, bring them here. They would be much uh, more welcome. They would be much more comfortable in terms of we have the resources. We, we, we have, they don't have the language barriers. And so it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's happened. They, they've already started to move them in. I think there was a push today to, to send them to Little Village, perhaps. There was, there was, there's been a meeting between some folks in Little Village and some community organizations in Woodlawn who are trying to come up with a joint plan maybe even going around the mayor to... to After to, millions to, of dollars have been put into the school to right, rehab it. Right. Gosh. We'll see I don't understand how they could be... How could you blindside the aldermen in that situation? Yeah, yeah. It just seems like uh, really bad just communication. And that's really. Jeanette Taylor who, who spoke out against this. Also, she was speaking out against the expansion of a rail yard in Englewood in her ward. Then she turned around and supported it. Mm. Does anyone know what happened there? All she did say at the council meeting was, you know, I've come around and I've, 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 uh, you know, I, I, I've evolved. No, you, that's not the right yeah, word, but yes. Maybe she, she got is, something. Yeah. You need more jobs. <laughs> that, that never happens in Chicago, right? Because, uh, this is Norfolk right? Southern. That's the company. So it's a big rail company. Maybe jobs for, oh, for residents of the ward. Yeah. Who knows? Fair enough. All right, let's uh, move on to a busy week in court. Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox drops all charges against R. Kelly as victims cry foul. Another temporary restraining order is issued against the state's assault weapons ban and the son of a former state rep with ties to ComEd, there's that company again, <laughs> found guilty of tax evasion charges. First, let's hear what Kim Fox had to say on Chicago Tonight about dropping these charges against R. Kelly. Essentially, Mr. Kelly is looking at, even before we got to the state cases, spending the rest of his life in prison. And so as a result of that, uh, we believe that justice has been served. Jason Meisner, you interviewed one of the victims represented in this Cook County case. And, and the justification here is he's going to be in jail probably the rest of his life because of these other cases. Our resources are better spent elsewhere. But what, is the, what did this victim tell you? Uh, it was actually my colleague, Megan Cropo, but it was a very powerful interview on the day that they dropped the charges. Actually, it was the night before, after Kim Fox announced mm -hmm. that she was going to drop the charges. Uh, she reached out and she said she wanted to talk. And she went over to, Megan went over to her lawyer's office and she opened up about how this has haunted her since she first went to police in 2003. Um, they never filed charges. Uh, she had evidence. She, she was willing to testify. She went through a grand jury. Uh, and then finally, you know, Kim Fox put out this rather unusual call for victims to come forward after the surviving R. Kelly series had aired. Uh, and she answered that call. And that's and, f the most difficult thing someone yeah. could probably do. Right. She, she stepped forward and she, she said she thought, finally, I'm, I'm going to get justice here. And then to have the charges dropped like they were, um, it, really, it really hit her hard. So um, there, there are, you know, this collateral damage when you put out that public plea, file the charges, and then um, everybody understands he's, he's going to be in prison for a long time. Um, but yeah, there's there's victims that are left in the wake. Right. Clearly, justice is going to be done in the R. Kelly case. But is this justice denied when you talk about victims like this woman who she's not going to get her day in court to point up at him on the witness stand and say, you did this? I, and I think one thing that Kim Fox could have and should have done was explain, OK, these trials would have cost X amount of dollars. We can use these to test the backlog of rape kits. We can use these to prosecute these, you know, this. We can, we can put this money toward, um, you know, abused women 
programs that will benefit abused women. I think if she had done something like that or if our office had, had outlined that or, or just even given some indication of, of other steps that they could have taken or were going to take, it would have been a little more palatable because otherwise, yeah, it just looks like we don't need you anymore. Well, and, and it sends a message to future victims and who might be want to come forward. It was very difficult for that yeah. woman to come forward, and and if they think they're not even going to get their day in court, and and they're not going to, in the case, it's not going to be pursued. Why would women want why to not? step forward? In fact, forward? her statement was odd. I thought in the sense that it was something about instead we will help those who don't have a documentary to support them. I mean, so it, focus it was, on other cases that yeah, are high it profile. Was, it really, I, I, mm. that, yeah, that, was, that, that might have been an odd thing to say. Is, is partially this the result of the fact that there are all these cases, federal cases, state cases in Minnesota and Georgia and New York and Illinois, should they have been consolidated somehow? It, it is R. Kelly overload at this point a little yeah. bit, but I mean, the federal investigations were going on on a separate track. Um, mm -hmm. Kim Fox filed these indictments in 2019 very quickly. I mean, it was only within like a matter of weeks after she had made that plea. Um, so uh, the federal trials, uh, you know, he was convicted in New York, sentenced to 30 years. He is appealing that case, and he could win that appeal. And, and remember uh, the case of Bill Cosby. I mean, he was going right. to be put away for life, and, his, and he got overturned. I mean, is there any chance R. Kelly's something like that could happen? Our appellate here? attorney, Jennifer Bonjean, is the person who was behind Bill Cosby getting his mm -hmm. case overturned. So absolutely, it could happen. But then he's got this other federal sentencing coming up in a couple of weeks where he faces at least 10 years and up to 90. Um, so I think, um, you know, for the Cook County to go forward with these indictments would be a little bit, you could argue that why are you doing this? Why are, two of the cases involved uh, victims that had already testified in federal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so in those cases, it, it does make sense. But as far as um, this one woman that we talked to, you no, know, she, she was um, devastated that they dropped Clearly, it. understandably upset about it. Uh, tell me about this. Uh, this guilty verdict for the son of former state rep Eddie Acevedo, who was close with Madigan, close with ComEd. Uh, what are the ramifications here? Uh, it was uh, close. It was and part of the son is Alex Acevedo's father. Alex Edward Acevedo. Acevedo. Yes, he was convicted. The jury was out for about 45 minutes, which in federal <laughs> court is probably the best. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the jurors have even touched the muffin tray. <laughs> you know, they were just like, he's guilty. It was a it was a simple tax case where he didn't report about seventy thousand dollars of lobbying income. But the whole reason they were on to him is because of the broader combat investigation. His father, Eddie, the former state rep, uh, they were looking closely at him because he was a matting guy and he was going into lobbying. And uh, Eddie pled guilty to his own tax out charges. There. Madigan guys that went into lobbying. <laughs> all right, all right. So this is kind of like a little bit of an appetizer. It had nothing directly to do with the payments that combat was making, alleged payments. But um, but yeah, we got to see a little bit of uh, of that investigation actually going to trial, which as you all know at the federal building is rare for a case, especially a tax case. To not case. get settled, to not yeah. get settled before trial. Yeah, he did not want to take a deal um, and he, you know, he, he's looking at maybe a year in prison, could get probation, so not a big case, but... And as you mentioned, appetizer for the main courses of these right. ComEd cases to come and Madigan case eventually, yeah. if that ever happens, uh, they have all these pre-trial motions they got to go through. And then finally in courts, uh, I think we got to ask this question every week, so give us the 411 and the status of all the lawsuits against the, the state assault weapons ban. Oh, well that, yeah, there's federal, there's the, uh, a recent Another temporary restraining order um, upheld downstate. As I understand it, there's two in downstate counties. Um, I helped out on that story for the Tribune, and I talked to a lot of experts about what the legal challenges might be, and they mostly agree that it's the federal cases that make the most sense. If you're going to challenge something that's eventually going to go to the Supreme Court, it makes the most sense. That's, that's the venue you want to be in, yeah, although so these, these state cases result in a temporary restraining order so the law well the law doesn't get enacted for the plaintiffs on this case so it's right. we're talking about a couple hundred people that do not have to follow the law but everybody else still like does like Darren Bailey congratulations Darren Bailey you, you get to keep your guns for now but I think uh, you know the state cases are interesting but I don't think in the end they're going to be the ones that go up the chain uh, it's going to be one of these federal cases one filed by the Illinois uh, Rifle Association and there, there's also another one. I think that's going to be consolidated. And much like Common and Madigan, these are going to take years, it seems oh, like, to, to suss out. Right. All yeah. right, well, let's uh, move on to some sports news this week. The greatest quarterback in NFL history, I think that's an objective statement. He oh, retires 
again. He retires again. The Chicago Sky's top free agent players moving on to other teams. The Chicago Bulls season confounds as the trade deadline approaches and remembering hockey great Bobby Hall. It's a complicated thing for Chicagoans this week. First of all, let's start with the NFL's greatest of all time, calling it quits again. Take a look. Good morning, guys. Uh, I'll get to the point right away. I'm retiring for good. Nancy Armour, what are the odds he shows up on a, uh, another team like Brett Favre did all those years ago? I think he's done this time. Um, if you look at the announcement last year versus the announcement this year, last year was a statement that he put out on Instagram. You know, he did the video. If you if you watch the video, he's he's clearly getting choked up toward the end. And then he also posted, and this was the thing that really kind of sealed it for me, he posted about 60, a little over 60 photos on his Instagram story from go a couple going back to high school, college, photos with his kids, his family, mm -hmm. all of his teammates. Um, that's not somebody who's not pretty certain that that this is it. Although some NFL executive probably does want to, you know, see if he can call him oh, up and entice had, him. With he a, had a market. I mean, he he. There would have been teams that would have been willing to give him money. But I think he, you know, he recognized, and you could see it in his play this year, that he's not the same Brady that he was. And do you want to go and start over? Do you want to go and, you know, if you're not on a team built to win a Super Bowl, and if that's if you have a team that's built to win a Super Bowl, you're not looking for Brady at this point. And I, so I don't think that team is the Bears that are built to win a Super Bowl right now. <laughs> not yet. Well, let's talk about another team that was built to win a championship but seems to have dismantled all that, the Chicago Sky. Yeah. They lost Candace Parker, Courtney Vandersloot, Allie Quigley. Why can't they keep these key members of their championship team? Well, it, so the, before that WNBA Finals, started, I talked to Mark Davis, who is the owner of the Las Vegas Aces, as well as the Las Vegas Raiders. And one thing he said, and you can see it, that there are owners, new owners, that are willing to put the money in because they recognize the financial possibilities that there are. Um, and you can see Mark Davis is one of those owners. Also, the New York Liberties owner is similar. Those are the teams that got everybody in free agency at this point. So I think this guy's going to have to start, you know, pumping more money into that team and you know we saw that they brought in another investor this week um, but you know players want to go where they're gonna have you know that they're not practicing in a community facility like this guy does um, you know Mark Davis just built a brand new facility for the Aces that's gonna open in March so this guy How do you compete with that? Yeah. Yeah. It's not, not the most attractive destination right now Bobby Hall the Golden Jet considered one of the greatest Chicago sports figures of all time but then problems in his personal mm -hmm. life. So how should Chicagoans reflect uh, on his legacy, given all that? You have to take both into consideration. And I've said this about, you know, whether it's Bobby Hull, Kobe Bryant, Ben Roethlisberger, all of these guys. If you, you can't just put them in a box as just an athlete. Um, they're humans. And good, bad, or indifferent, you have to deal with all of it. And Bobby Hull, there was some really bad stuff. Um, you know, the domestic abuse allegations, uh, racism, some of the other problematic things that he said. You, you can't just think about the athlete and not the person. It's, that's not realistic. And I know that's been a hot topic on sports radio. I mean, there's been some sports radio hosts saying, hey, we can't just lionize the guy without talking right. about that. Other folks just say, no, he was the greatest Black Hawk of all time, one of the greatest sports heroes of all time. Uh, really interesting discussion. But again, you know, he, he passed away this week. Uh, and our condolences to his family. The Bulls, uh, they're approaching the trade deadline. A uh, disappointing season. Do they make any moves? <sighs> I don't know, and I think it's going to be real interesting to see what they do. I think Lonzo Ball is a, a key to all of this. He hasn't played in more than a year. There's no quite, there's no timeline for when he comes back. So do you hope that he'll be back next season, you keep the pieces around him, or do you say he's not coming back and we need to blow it up and, and get something for the guys that we can at this point? And, and DeMar DeRozan would be the most valuable chip that they have. Yes, um, and also, too, um, uh, Zach Levine? No, Vucevic. Uh, Vucevic, thank you. Um, he has going to be a free agent or a qualified free agent this summer, so do you, do you get something for him now or take the risk of losing it you know, down the road? And you could go a bunch of different ways, and I don't, like I said, I think Lon, the, the health of Lonzo Ball, I think, is the key to all of this. All right, well, uh, Bull's in a precarious position right now, just like the Bears. Uh, can't wait. For the uh, draft in April, I don't even care about the Super Bowl. Let's just get to the <laughs> let's just get to the draft and see what happens. All right, we're out of time here. Our thanks to Marianne Ahern, Laura Washington, Nancy Armour, and Jason Meisner.
And that is our show for this Friday night. Don't forget you can get our program streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And be sure to join me and Brandon Friedman tonight, tonight at 10 p.m. for Chicago Tonight. It's a brand new thing. We do Chicago Tonight on Friday nights at 10 now, so tune in. A local resident says they were politically targeted after speaking at this week's city council meeting. That's one of the stories we're following. And what's driving racial disparities in homicide clearance rates. And now for the Week in Review, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and see you at 10. Um, Marianne, I have to prepare for this uh, forum uh, on Tuesday. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> how, how, how am I supposed to wrangle all these I people? Know. Good luck, good luck. Uh, <laughs> Are you yeah, we, everybody? Every, everybody that, yeah. that I know of at this point. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Be wild. It's, yeah. No <laughs> time limits either. Oh, oh. Why is that? Well, we just don't do that. We don't, we don't have like, all right, 30 seconds to answer this oh, question. Wow. And what about days, making yeah. sure of equal time? I think I'm just going to have to take a pencil and, yeah. and a stopwatch and, okay. I don't know. The last one was a real. That was, yeah. that was a hoot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, you've got to make your move. This is, you, there's not much yeah. time left, so yeah. you're going to, which I thought right. Sophia King made some. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud to be a multilingual law firm that provides translators for a variety of languages. Attended the mayor retaliate against a private citizen for voicing an opinion at city council. Plus, why CPD solved fewer crimes involving black men. Remembering Martin Luther King in Marquette Park and a profile of a Chicago Grammy nominated producer. All that on Chicago Tonight. Next time. We put our lives in each other's hands. The head of a social media company is murdered. He must have been stopped before he exited the plane. But that couldn't have happened. Zach was alive when he jumped. This guy is our crime scene. Death in Paradise. Saturday at 7 on WTTW. On Frankie Drake Mysteries. There was blood everywhere. A man is stabbed to death in his home. A killer shows up in the middle of the afternoon and no one notices. The victim.